you can see that we have our drawings done ahead of time. That was uh, in an effort to save time. Mm -hmm. Right, and because it takes me quite a bit of time to do the drawing, and we wanted the audience to be able to see right away our painting process. And so we worked out our, our you know, sketches beforehand. Um, and it's, it's a scene from South Beach, Fisher's Island, that we have painted plein air on a few occasions that, that was the inspiration for this, this scene. And you can see that as, a, as an oil uh, painter that I still have to do the block and I still have to find the darks and this is what I'm doing. So even though the drawing itself has a certain amount of the values on it, by using uh, that heavy, dark, pigmented paint, I can establish the darkest darks in the in the painting. Right, right, and and I do the same thing as I progress in my watercolor, which you'll see later in the film. But I do the same thing, starting from lights and working toward my dark, whereas Howard establishes those darks right away. So I can see that your source of light is coming from the left, and you're darkening up, um, you know, the the sides of the rocks and the beach area, et cetera, that will be in shade and shadow. And, and there's still a certain amount of drawing going on, but I'm using a large brush so I don't get too fiddly with it. Right? That's one of the things you have to be careful of is to, if you're too illustrative too soon, what will happen is that you will, will fight to try to save your drawing. And the more right. you try to do that, the more right. you have the chance of losing your drawing. And, and what about, what are you doing with the paper towel now, Howard? Well, What's... some of that is lifting out some of the darker mm -hmm. uh, pigmented areas to gray them out. In other words, um, the further away an object is, the uh, less chromatic it is, the, the less dark the darks are, and the, and the slightly cooler in some instances. Here, the, the, the black that I made, or the brown that I made, is a, like a Van Dyke brown. Um, the only value in that color really is in the name. <laughs> it's a terrible brown. You can see how purpley it kind of looks. But sometimes that can work very well depending on what colors you put in on top of it. Mm -hmm. And what colors do you mix to make that brown? I use the ivory black and uh, cornacridone red. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I can put a touch of orange in it if I want to go towards a sepia or a sienna of some sort. Here I wanted that uh, certain coolness and a fair amount of contrast coming up. Right, right. And it seems like I, I know having stood on that beach and seen how many rocks are on that beach, you really simplified that. Correct. And I can see you're talking about your palette now. Well, it's a very simple palette, ivory black, quinacridone red, uh, hence a yellow, ultramarine blue, and viridian. And out of these colors, you can make just about any color you need to make. I think I'm explaining how I make that, mm -hmm. that uh, Van Dyke brown. Mm -hmm. And what white do you use? That's a... Uh, it's really a, a lead white replacement, mm -hmm. so it's a, it has a um, it had, does have some titanium white in it, but it's a lead white with the titanium in it. Yeah, and what's the value of using the limited palette? I think you can go back to the colors that you found originally. It's very easy to go back and find the colors that you made, find the values you want from each color that you do make. You can see that those are considered primaries. Right. Uh, and unlike you, getting this wonderful wash of light right away, that's your lights mm -hmm. right away coming in. Your drawing, as you can see, the drawing had to be fairly accurate. Mm doing that it allowed me to be a bit freer with the painting because I'm not worried about trying to work out the perspective in the course of my painting so that allows my painting process to move fairly rapidly. Yeah, and you're, yeah you're going to be more concerned about the, the color that you have and how you can use that to... Exactly. Uh, you are going to work on values anyway, right? right? You still do that. Right. And what I've done here is I've done a light wash of sort of a raw sienna and a cad yellow for that undertone of the sky and then I'm coming coming into that with a cooler mix that's going to be for the sky color that's going to go in there. And I can see you're getting some sky color in your sky too, Howard. You've got some of that. Some Trying of that. to do some large block ends and establishing where the light's coming from. I'm using a, a fairly large uh, painting knife to 
uh, cover a lot of territory in a short period of time, but also to keep a certain looseness and freshness to mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. You manage to do that, even though you draw extremely uh, uh, accurately, you still manage to keep a certain freshness. How do you do that? How do you manage to keep that, yeah. that uh, wonderful freedom and not ha making it look overworked? Well, I use a large brush for my sky. I use the, it's the hake brush, which is a Japanese goat hair brush, which is a beautiful brush for doing skies, trees, and keeping things loose. This here I'm using the one and a half inch flat, and using a larger brush just keeps you from you know, getting too over fiddly with everything. Right here, I'm trying to work out some of the waves and leaving some of the white for those waves and, right. and, and wavelets. So that large tool just stops you from, from going into too much detail right. too soon. Exactly. And so you, again, you're using a fairly large palette knife to get your water in, Howard. Right, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with you, Lisa. You've got your sky done and you've got your water coming in and I still have a long way to go. So that you do that with a certain amount of rapidity and, uh, and, and some wonderful accuracy. Look at how you pick up two different uh, pigments. I know you can do it much stronger, but in this case, how you make your water it doesn't have to be all perfect waves. It doesn't have to be, it, you're still looking for the odd shapes that you can pull together and have them be part of the painting. Exactly. And you can see that I've really varied up the color and actually warmed up the color as it's come forward, which allows, you know, objects that are warmer come forward, cooler cooler objects move back. Yeah, they and recede. So yeah. They recede. And, and you see that in the water. That's really mm -hmm. lovely how that how that worked out. Mm -hmm. Often the, the water is not dark when it's further away, but it, in this case, we remember the day we right. painted the scene multiple times. Right. And that uh, in, in that particular day, it was uh, right. we had a lot of dark water. And you can see in your water the warmth as you come forward. Um, that really helps you get that sense of the perspective of the water. And now it looks like you're adding some real warms to your beach, um, and to that that the the sand, and getting some of the sense that that water is coming up on that beach. That's really right. beautiful. Right. I'm trying to get a a feeling of wet sand there, um, not being too purpley. That that can be, that can be overdone. And, and yet I still use a lot of violets and a lot of purple, and because it, you find that to be a, a neutralizing uh, color. If you right. want to neutralize a green, you want to. It's opposite of a yellow, and so you can right. see how you could really use that any way you, any way you want it. Not over mixing that color so that when I make a mark with a knife, very much the way you do when you pick up multiple pigments with one picking up of your brush, I'm trying to introduce several, several colors on my knife so that when I pull it through it makes that right. color without having to go back into it. Right. Now here you're doing the same thing with that big hake brush. How do you get that kind of detail with that brush? Well I'm using, I'm, you can see I'm using the corners, the edges, and I'm also putting several colors on my, uh, several pigments on my brush at the same time so that gets that varied color, you know, so that it's not boring, but it has some real interest to it. There's green and there's Absolutely. also some warms in there. I even got some reds in there. Uh -huh. And this will be my first layer. Again, with watercolor, it will dry back a lot, and then I will come back in and darken that up quite a bit. Yeah, you're still um, establishing your light source. You still see that, but boy, that's just lovely brush handling and, and the way that it's very lively. It's very, really very nice. Yeah, and the key with all of these, I, I use the hake and this one and a half inch flat for the majority of my painting, um, the same way you use large palette knives for the majority of yours, which allows for that freshness. Right, it just stops and you from fiddling too exactly. much. Exactly. That's that. Uh, there's plenty of time to fiddle with the painting later. <laughs> you can ruin your painting at the very end. Exactly. So. But you know, I'm right now. I'm I'm trying to get a lot of those whites filled in because it, it can be hard to to view to understand what's happening and view the painting when there's a lot of scattered white. So I really try to get those. I'll get those rocks, the first layer of those rocks done, so that it'll start to come together. And I'm using my test strip to test out my colors here. Right, right. Um, That's great. That test strip really is a is a wonderful. Uh, uh, application to watercolors because otherwise I think it's so difficult to do to find uh, save your 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 whites mm -hmm. um, as an oil painter I try to get rid of as much of my whites as possible but here you save your whites you have to fight to save that white so that those are your highlights those are the things right. that you want
And here I'm coming in with really strong, thick pigment, as you can see on the face of that rock. Um, and you can see how much it dries back as you do it, but I really want that to stand out. That's a, that's a key element in this painting that's going to pull the viewer in, just like the rock in your painting. Absolutely. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's really well said. So here, here's that rock, and again I tried to pick up multiple uh, hues on the knife so that any time that I made some kind of a mark it would come up with uh, uh, several of the, of the hues. They have to be all within the right value of whatever you're putting down. Right. And so choosing that can be difficult, but I think as a watercolorist it must be extremely difficult for you even though you use that test strip the way you do and you use it very well. Uh, it, I think it must be uh, difficult because laying down that color is it's, it's pretty hard to, to mm -hmm. take it back, isn't it? Right. And you can see on my large rock, I used a credit card to kind of scrape across that to create a little bit of a sense of texture, um, which is, can be a really useful, useful thing to do, just not to overdo it. And here you are, you're putting some, some of those lights on there and really getting some, some highlights there. Right. And going from dark to light, I think is uh, is so much easier than going from from uh, light to dark the way you have to in in uh, in watercolor. So I can make these adjustments to uh, the values. I think a lot easier than than a watercolorist, and yet you mm -hmm. handle that extremely well. You you your test strip, of course, helps you do that, but you do handle that extremely well, and you and you manage to make uh, very interesting uh, marks and value changes and and temperature changes. And and I can see that you're working on your boat, and that's such an important element of your painting. You know, you're going to come in at that rock, and you're going to go right up to that boat. Your eye's going to be drawn to that, and did a did a very simplified version of that boat. Absolutely, keep it without simple. Without overworking you know. it. But here with your painting, you do the same thing. You came into the big mm -hmm. rock, and your figures are going to be a key element. I decided to get rid of those. Uh, what, what, they, what made you decide to do that? What it, was was, the... it was not part of the story in, in yeah. the end. In the drawing, I thought it looked pretty good. But as I started putting paint on, I started to think, no, you know what, I don't need that there. Mm -hmm. I, it's not part of the story. And uh, the sailboat is placed on a third away from the edge, and that's really just a way to get the viewer into the painting, moving around. And that, that group of small sailboats, I think, would have been... A, a deterrent. To, you you yeah. want it to come right back down to these rocks of that beach, come back to the big rock again and have their eyes circle around right. the painting that way. And I think that was really effective, what you just did in removing the sailboats. And that is, you can do that in watercolor also. If you, if you realize there's a component you don't want, you can erase that pencil or paint over it and you have the option to do that. Well, you can lift out a certain amount. Here, here you're now coming into one of the key elements of your storytelling uh, in this painting that you've done, they not only uh, lend scale to the painting, but uh, they're interesting and fun, and they, uh, they're they just really sweet. The human eye wants to find that element. So the rock is very strong. It's going to take over part of that, uh, that viewer. He's going to go right to that rock. It's very strong, but it'll right. find its way to those figures. Right. And here I'm darkening up some of that foreground beach to really pull it forward and pull the viewer into that. Um, and that's something really important in watercolor, to not be afraid to start punching up that color and warming it up with heavy pigment. Right. And I think warming it is really a key element to that. Of course, you could have made a shadow, you could have made a purple streak or whatever, not here on this beach perhaps, but the warmth that you've indicated here really gives a sense of that sand, the, 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 the path that people would follow down. Now you're just cleaning up some of your edges, right? You're making mm -hmm. things strong. Look how you touch that with your finger. I couldn't right. do that in oil paints. But right. you lift out some of the paint with your finger, don't you? There's a lot of that in watercolor where you're just making those adjustments. They're pretty subtle, um, but you're doing that you know, throughout the process. You can see how effective that is. It lets you just you know, start to amplify the areas right. of the painting that and, you really want to yeah. bring your viewer into. Yeah, and that far away you don't want things that are too crisp or too right. sharp, so when you put your finger in there, you soften that edge a little bit. Exactly. So edges are really important, they're really, right. so you you need those edges, some broken edges, you need broken color, which is what you're doing here. And, and I'm using a smaller brush, you can see, right. the one inch flat, to, to get you, some of those more crisp lines right. and, and get more detail. And that's what you do toward the end of your watercolors, you start and using And yet here you brush. are with that large yep. brush, 
because you are making yourself be looser, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. that's what you're doing with that brush. Exactly. And it's huge. You're just using a corner of it. Yep. But it still takes a fair amount of uh, exactly. Of, uh, and 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 I can see you're getting into some of the detail too in your foreground beach, um, and sort of wrapping up your painting. You're coming to the point of deciding how much farther to go with it, right? We both. And we will, you know, often after a plein air session, come in and add, a, you know, once we see it in the studio, punch some things up, once we can see the color in a different light. Correct. Right? That's often a process that, that happens with any kind of a demo or a plein air. Well, the person that, that's going to own this painting in the end will have it inside their house. They're not going to be right. looking at it in the outside light that we saw. They might have color corrected lights, but it's still going to be different. Right. And so, boy, you're really punching that up there. Yep. And uh, that that seems to be very effective. Those rocks were very dark, yeah. weren't they? Right. Those those rocks that are out in the water that have you know they have that glisten. They sort of glisten. They almost look black, really. And so I'm using it looks like a mix of panes um, and a little vermilion, little Prussian blue, to really get the de that depth of those rocks. So um, even though even though they're dark, they're cool. Exactly. It keeps them cool as they recede, and you want the dark, the rocks in the foreground to be a bit warmer. So I'm getting, and I'm also you know getting a little more detail in some of those wa wavelets coming into the shore there. Well, we know because we painted this scene so many times. We go out to Fisher's Island, paint it uh, plein air. We know how high that water comes. That large rock is almost entirely submerged. Well, that was a fun event, and, and the crowd were, they were really pretty nice to us, weren't they? They didn't oh, yeah. throw beer bottles at us or anything. <laughs> it was a wonderful event. And, Keep talking. Uh, and, you know, we hope to hope that everyone can enjoy future demos like that. Um, anytime you have a chance to, to watch some artists work, it's worth it. It definitely is. Because you will learn definitely. a lot from it. And it's fun from our side, too. Absolutely. You know.